Chapter 6 of The Life Story of a Black Bear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter 6 Life in Camp. One of the results of Kawa's disappearance was to make me much more solitary than I had ever been before, not merely because I did not have her to play with, but now, for the first time, I took to wandering on excursions by myself. And these excursions all had one object, to find Kawa. For some days after her capture, we waited about the outskirts of the town nearly all night long, but on the third or fourth morning father made up his mind that it was useless, and, though mother persuaded him not to abandon the search for another night or two, he insisted after that on giving up and returning to the neighbourhood where we had been living since the fire. So we turned our backs upon the town, and, for my part very reluctantly, went home. The moon was not yet much past the full, and I can remember now how the berry patch looked that night as we passed it, lying white and shining in the moonlight. We saw no other bears at it, and did not stop, but kept under the trees round the edges, and went on to our favourite resting place, where, a few hundred yards from the river, a couple of huge trees had at some time been blown down. Round their great trunks as they lay on the ground, Young trees and a mass of elder bushes and other brushwood had sprung up, making a dense thicket. The two logs lay side by side, and in between them, with the tangle of bushes all round and the branches of the other trees overhead, there was a complete and impenetrable shelter. We had used this place so much that a regular path was worn to it through the bushes. This night, as we came near, we saw recent prints of a bear's feet on the path, and the bear that made them was evidently a big one. From the way father growled when he saw them, I think he guessed at once whose feet they were. I know that I had my suspicions, suspicions which soon proved to be correct. During our absence, our enemy, the surly bear that I have spoken of, had taken it into his head that he would occupy our home. Of course, he had lived in this district much longer than we, and, had this been his home when we first came, we should never have thought of disputing possession with him. But it had been our home now, so far as we had any regular home at this time of year, ever since our arrival after the fire, while he had lived half a mile away. Now, however, there he was, standing obstinately in the pathway, swinging his head from side to side and evidently intending to fight rather than go away. We all stopped, my father in front, my mother next, and I behind. I've said that the stranger was bigger than my father, and in an ordinary meeting in the forest I do not think my father would have attempted to stand up to him, but this was different. It was our home, and we all felt that he had no right there, but that, on the contrary, he was behaving as he was out of pure bad temper and a desire to bully us and make himself unpleasant. Moreover, the events of the last few days had rendered my father and mother irritable, and they were in no mood to be polite to anybody. Usually it takes a long time to make two bears fight. We begin slowly, growling and walking sideways towards each other, and only getting nearer inch by inch. But on this occasion there was not much room in the path, and father was thoroughly exasperated. He hardly waited at all, but just stood sniffling with his nose up for a minute to see if the other showed any sign of going away. And then without further warning, threw himself at him. I had never seen my father in a real fight, and now he was simply splendid. 
Before the stranger had time to realise what was happening, he was flung back on his haunches, and in a moment they were rolling over and over in one mass in the bushes. At first it was impossible to see what was going on, but in spite of the ferocity of my father's rush, it soon became evident that in the end the bigger bear must win. My father's face was buried in the other's left shoulder, and he had evidently got a good grip there. But he was almost on his back, for the stranger had worked himself uppermost, and we could see that he was trying to get his teeth round my father's foreleg. Had he once got hold, nothing could have saved the leg, bone and all, from being crushed to pieces, and father, if not killed, would certainly have been beaten and probably crippled for life. And sooner or later, it seemed certain that the stranger would get his hold. Then it was that my mother interfered. Hurling herself at him, she threw her whole weight into one swinging blow on the side of the big bear's head, and in another second had plunged her teeth into the back of his neck. My father's grip in the fleshy part of the shoulder, however painful it might be, had little real effect, but where my mother had attacked, behind the right ear, was a different matter. The stranger was obliged to leave my father's leg alone, and to turn and defend himself against this new onslaught. But, big as he was, he now had more on his hands than he could manage. As soon as he turned his attention to my mother, my father let go of his shoulder, and in his turn tried to grip the other's foreleg. There was nothing for the stranger to do now but to get out of it as fast as he could, and even I could not help admiring his strength as he lifted himself up and shook mother off as lightly as she would have shaken me. She escaped the wicked blow that he aimed at her and dodged out of his reach, and my father, letting go his hold of the foreleg, did the same. The stranger, with one on either side of him, backed himself against one of the fallen logs and waited for them to attack him. But that they had no wish to do. All they wanted was that he should go away, and they told him so. They moved aside from the path on either hand to give him space to go, and slowly and surlily he began to move. I was still standing in the pathway. Suddenly he made a movement as if to rush at me but my father and mother jumped towards him simultaneously while I plunged into the bushes, and he was compelled to turn and defend himself against my parents again. But they did not attack him, though they followed him slowly along the path. Every step or two he stopped to make an ugly start back at one or the other, but he knew that he was overmatched, and yard by yard he made off, my father and mother following him as far as the edge of the thicket and standing to watch him out of sight. And I was glad when he was safely gone, and they came back to me. It was not a pleasant homecoming, and we were all restless and nervous for days afterwards, and then it was that I vowed to myself that, if ever I grew up and the opportunity came, I would wreak vengeance on that bear. If we were all nervous, I was the worst, and in my restlessness took to going off by myself. Up to this time I do not think I had ever been a hundred yards away from one or the other of my parents, and now, when I started out alone, it was always in horrible fear of meeting the big bear when there was no one to stand by me. Gradually, however, I acquired confidence in myself making each night a longer trip alone, and each night going in the direction of the town. At last, one night, I found myself at the edge of the town itself, and now, when I was alone, I did not stop at the first building that I came to, but very cautiously, for the man-smell was thick around me and terrified me in spite of myself, very cautiously, I began to thread my way in between the buildings. The new mining town, or camp, of the far west has no long rows of houses or paved streets. The houses are built of logs or of boards, rarely more than one story high, 
and are set down irregularly. There may be one more or less well-defined street, the main trail running through the camp, but even along that there will be wide gaps between the houses, while, for the rest, the buildings are at all sorts of angles, so that a man, or a bear, may wander through them as he pleases, regardless of whether he is following a street or not. As I snuffed round each building, I found all sorts of new things to eat, with strange tastes, but most of them were good. That the men were not all asleep was plain from the shouts and noises which reached me at times from the centre of the big town, where, as I could see by occasional glimpses which I caught through the nearer buildings, many of the houses had bright light streaming from them all night. Avoiding these, I wandered on, picking up things to eat, and all the while keeping ears and nose open for a sign of Kawa. I stayed thus, moving in and out among the buildings, till dawn. Once a dog inside a house barked furiously as I came near, and I heard a man's voice speaking to it, and I hurried on. As the sky began to lighten, I made my way out into the woods again, and rejoined my father and mother before the sun was up. When I joined them, my father growled at me, because I smelled of man. The next night found me down in the town again. I began to know my way about. I learned which houses contained dogs and avoided them. Other animals besides myself, I discovered, came into the town at night for the sake of the food which they found lying about. Coyotes and wood rats and polecats. But though bears would occasionally visit the buildings nearest to the woods, no other penetrated into the heart of the town as I did. It had a curious fascination for me, and gradually I grew so much at home that even when a man came through the buildings towards me, I only slipped out of his way round a corner, and, for man's sight and smell are both miserably bad compared with ours, he never had a suspicion that I was near. On the third or fourth night I had gone nearer to the lighted buildings than I had ever been before, when I heard a sound that made me stop dead and throw myself up on my haunches to listen. Yes, there could be no doubt of it. It was Kawa's voice. Anyone who did not know her might have thought that she was angry, but I knew better. She was making exactly the noise that she used to make when romping with me, and I knew that she was not angry, but only pretending, and that she must be playing with someone. I suppose I ought to have been glad that she was alive and happy enough to be able to play, but it only enraged me and made me wonder who her playmates might be. Then, gradually, the truth, the incredible truth, dawned upon me. Truly incredible it seemed at first, but there could be no doubt of it. She was playing with man. I could hear men's voices speaking to her, as if in anger, and then I heard her voice and theirs in turn again, and at last I recognised that their anger was no more real than hers. The sounds came from where the lights were brightest, and it was long before I could make up my mind to go near enough to be able to see. At last, however, I crept to a place from which I could look out between two buildings, keeping in the deep shade myself, and I can see now every detail of what met my eyes as plainly as if it was all before me at this minute. There was a building larger than those around it, with a big door wide open, and from the door, and from the windows on either side, poured streams of light out into the night. In the middle of the light, and almost in front of the door, was a group of five or six men, and in the centre of the group was Kawa, tied to a post by a chain which was fastened to a collar around her neck. I saw a man stoop down and hold something out to her, presumably something to eat, and then 
as she came to take it from the hand which he held out, he suddenly drew it away and hit her on the side of the head with his other hand. He did not hit hard enough to hurt her, and it was evidently done in play, because, as he did it, she got up on her hind legs and slapped at him, first with one hand and then with the other, growling all the time in angry make-believe. Sometimes the man came too near, and Kaba would hit him, and the other men all burst out laughing. Then I saw him walk deliberately right up to her, and they took hold of each other and wrestled, just as Kawa and I used to do by the old place under the cedar trees when we were little cubs. I could see, too, that now and then she was not doing her best and did not want to hurt him, and he certainly did not hurt her. At last the men went into the building, leaving Kawa alone outside, but other men were continually coming out of or going into the open door, and I was afraid to approach her, or even to make any noise to tell her of my presence. So I sat in the shade of the buildings and watched. Nearly every man who passed stopped for a minute and spoke to her, but none, except the man whom I had first seen, tried to play with her or went within her reach. The whole thing seemed to me incredible, but there it was, under my eyes, and somehow it made me feel terribly lonely. All the lonelier, I think, because she had these new friends, for as friends she undoubtedly regarded them, while I could not even go near enough to speak to her. At last so many men came out of the building that I was afraid to stay. Some of them went one way and some another, and I had to keep constantly moving my position to avoid being seen. In doing so, I found myself further and further away from the centre of the town and nearer to the outskirts. The men shouted and laughed and made so much noise that I did not dare to go back, but made my way out into the woods, and for the first time I did not go home to my father and mother but stayed by myself in the brush. The next evening I again made my way into the town, and once more saw the same sights as on the preceding night. This evening, however, there was a wind blowing, and it blew directly from me, as I stood in the same place, to Kawa in front of the lighted door. Suddenly, while she was in the middle of her play, I saw her stop and begin to snuff up the wind with every sign of excitement. And then she called to me. Answer, I dared not, but I knew that she had recognised me and would understand why I did not speak. While she was still calling to me, the man with whom she'd been playing, the same man as on the night before, came up and gave her a cuff on the head and she lost her temper in earnest. She hit at him angrily, but he jumped out of her way. How I wish she had caught him! And, after trying for a while to tempt her to play again, he and the other men left her and went into the building. Then she gave all her time to me, and at last, when nobody was near, I spoke just loud enough for her to hear. She simply danced with excitement, running to the end of her chain towards me, until it threw her back onto her hind legs, circling round and round the stump to which she was fastened, and then charging out to the end of her chain again, all the time whimpering and calling to me in a way which made me long to go to her. I did not dare to show myself, however, but waited until, as on the night before, just as it was beginning to get light, the men all came out of the building and scattered in different directions. This time, however, I did not go back to the woods, but merely shifted out of the men's way behind the dark corners of the buildings, hoping that somehow I would find an opportunity of getting to speak to Kawa. At last the building was quiet, and only the man who had played with Kawa seemed to be left, and I saw the lights inside begin to grow less. I hoped that then the door would be shut, 
and the man inside would go to sleep, as I knew that men did in other houses when the lights disappeared at night. But while there was still some light issuing from door and windows, the man came out and went up to Kawa, and, unfastening the chain from the stump, proceeded to lead her away somewhere to the rear of the building. She struggled and tried to pull away from him, but he jerked her along with the chain, and I could see that she was afraid of him and did not dare to fight him in earnest, and bit by bit he dragged her along. I followed and saw him go to a sort of pen or small enclosure of high walls without any roof, in which he left her, and then went into his own building, and soon I saw the last lights go out inside, and everything was quiet. I stole round to the pen and spoke to Kawa through the walls. She was crazy at the sound of my voice, and I could hear her running round and round inside, dragging the chain after her. Could she not climb out? I asked her. No, the walls were made of straight, smooth boards, with nothing that she could get her claws into, and much too high to jump but we found a crack close to the ground through which our noses would almost touch, and that was some consolation. I stayed there as long as I dared, and told her all that had happened since she was taken away, of the fight with the strange bear, and how I had been in the town alone looking for her night after night, and she told me her story, parts of which I could not believe at the time, though now I can understand them better. What puzzled me, and at the time made me thoroughly angry, was the way in which she spoke of the man whom I had seen playing with her, and who had dragged her into the pen. She was afraid of him in a curious way, in much the same way as she was afraid of father or mother. The idea that she could feel any affection for him, I would have scouted as preposterous, but after the experiences of the last few nights, nothing seemed too wonderful to be true and it was plain that all her thoughts centred in him, and he represented everything in life to her. Without him, she would have no food. But as it was, she had plenty. He never came to her without bringing things to eat, delightful things sometimes, and in particular she told me of pieces of white stuff, square and rough like small stones, but sweeter and more delicious than honey. Of course, I know now that it was sugar, but as she told me about it then, and how good it was, and how the man always had pieces of it in his pockets, which he gave to her while they were playing together, I found myself envying her, and even wishing that the man would take me to play with too. But as we talked, the day was getting lighter, and, promising to come again next night, I slipped away in the dawn into the woods. Night after night I used to go and speak to Kawa. Sometimes I did not go until it was nearly daylight, and she was already in her pen. Sometimes I went earlier and watched her with the men before the door of the building, and often I saw the man who was her master playing with her and giving her lumps of sugar, and I could tell from the way in which she ate it how good it was. Many times I had narrow escapes of being seen, for I grew careless and trotted among the houses as if I were in the middle of the forest. More than once I came close to a man unexpectedly, for the man smell was so strong everywhere that a single man, more or less in my neighbourhood, made no difference, and I had to trust to my eyes and ears entirely. Somehow, however, I managed always to keep out of their way, and during this time I used to eat very little wild food, living almost altogether on the things that I picked up in the town. And during all these days and nights I never saw my father or my mother. Then, one evening, an eventful thing happened. The door of Kawa's pen closed with a latch from the outside, a large piece of iron which lifted and fell, and was then kept in place by a block of wood. I had spent a great deal of time at that latch, lifting it with my nose, and biting and worrying it in the hopes of breaking it off or opening the door, 
but when I did that, I was always standing on my hind legs, so as to reach up to it, with my forefeet on the door, and of course, my weight kept the door shut. But that never occurred to me. One evening, however, I happened to be standing up and sniffing at the latch, with my forefeet not on the door itself, but on the wall beside the door. It happened that, just as I lifted the latch with my nose, Kawa put her forefeet against the door on the inside. To my astonishment, the door swung open into my face, and Kawa came rolling out. If we had only thought it out, we could just as well have done that on the first night, instead of trying to reach each other for nearly two weeks through a narrow crack in the wall, until nearly all the skin was rubbed off our noses. However, it was done at last, and we were so glad that we thought of nothing else. Now we were free to go back into the woods and take up our old life again with father and mother. Would it not be glorious? I asked. Yes, she said, it would be glorious to go off into the woods and never, 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 I said, to see or think of man again. Yes, yes, she said, but of course it would be very glorious, but, well, there was the white stuff, the sugar. She could come back once in a while just once in a while, couldn't she, to see the men and get a lump or two? I'm afraid I lost my temper. Here was what ought to have been a moment of complete happiness, spoiled by her greediness. Of course she could not come back, I told her. If she did, she would never get away a second time. We would go to father and mother and persuade them to move just as far away from man as they could. Instead of being delighted, the prospect only made her gloomy and thoughtful. Of course she wanted to see father and mother, but, but, but... There was always that but, and the thought of the man and the sugar. While we were arguing, the time came when I usually left the town for the day, and the immediate thing to be done was to get her away from that place and out into the woods. Then, I thought, I could prevent her going back into the town. So, by pointing out to her that, if she wanted to, she could come back at any time, I persuaded her to move, and we started off through the buildings on the road that I usually took back to the forest. But at the first step, we were reminded of her chain, which was still attached to her collar and dragging along the ground as she walked. It was a nuisance, but there was no way of getting it off at the moment. Perhaps, when we were safe away and had plenty of time, we could find some way of loosening it. But at present, the first thing was to get clear of the town. So we started, but the path was new to Kawa, who, of course, had never been away from the pen and the door of the building where her master lived and had seen nothing of the town except as she was being dragged in by the men who had caught her, and then she had been too busy fighting to pay any attention to her surroundings. So, at almost every step, she must needs stop to smell something. Meanwhile, it was getting lighter, and we began to hear noises of men moving about inside the buildings. Once, a door opened, and I only just had time to dodge back and keep Kawa behind as a man stepped out into the air. But we succeeded in reaching the very edge of the town before anything serious happened. The houses were all made of wood, those in the middle, like that where Kawa had lived, being of boards nailed together, and those on the outskirts of logs laid upon each other whole, with the bark still on, like the first houses that we had seen up the river. There was one of this last kind in particular, which stood away from all the others, almost inside the forest. It was the first house that I came to each evening on approaching the town, and the last one that I passed on leaving it. But I always gave it a wide berth, because there was a dog there. A small dog, it's true, but a noisy one, 
and the first time that I came that way he had seen me, and made such a fuss that I had to bolt back into the forest and wait a long time before I dared go on again. Now, however, Kawa insisted on going up to snuff around this house. I warned her of the dog, but the truth was that she had grown accustomed to dogs, and I think she'd really lost her fear of men. So she went up close to the house and began smelling round the walls to see if there was anything good to eat, while I stood back under the trees, fretting and impatient of her delay. Having sniffed all along one side of the house, she passed round the corner to the back. In turning the corner, she came right upon the dog, who flew at her at once, though he was not much bigger than her head. Whether she was accustomed to dogs or not, the sudden attack startled her, and she turned round to run back to me. In doing so, she just grazed the corner of the house, and the next instant she was rolling head over heels on the ground. The end of her chain had caught in the crack between the ends of two of the logs at the corner, and she was held as firmly as if she'd been tied to her stump in front of the door. As she rolled over, the dog jumped on her, small as he was, yelping all the time and barking furiously. I thought it would only be a momentary delay, but the chain held fast, and all the while the dog's attacks made it impossible for her to give her attention to trying to tear it free. A minute later, and the door of the house burst open, and a man came running out, carrying, to my horror, a thunder stick in his hand. Kawa and the dog were all mixed up together on the ground, and I saw the man stop and stand still a moment and point the thunder stick at her. And then came that terrible noise of the thunderstick speaking. Too frightened to see what had happened, I took to my heels and plunged into the wood as fast as I could, without the man or the dog having seen me. I ran on for some distance till I felt safe enough to stop and listen, but there was not a sound, and no sign of Kawa coming after me. I waited and waited until the sun came up, and still there was no sign of Kawa, until at last I summoned up courage to steal slowly back again. As I came near, I heard the dog barking at intervals, and then the voices of men. Very cautiously, I crept near enough to get a view of the house from behind, and as I came in sight of the corner where Kawa had fallen, I saw her for the second time, just as on that wretched evening at the berry patch, surrounded by a group of three or four men. But this time they had no ropes round her, and were not trying to drag her away. Only they stood talking and looking down at her, while she lay dead on the ground before them. End of chapter 6 Recording by Jim's Vox 4「Seven of the Life Story of a Black Bear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. The Parting of the Ways. Now, indeed, I was truly lonely. During the three or four weeks that had passed since I had seen my father or mother, I had in a measure learned to rely upon myself. Nor had I so far felt the separation keenly, because I knew that every evening I should see Kawa. Now she was gone for ever. There was no longer any object in going into the town, and the terror of that last scene was still so vivid in my mind that I wished never to see man again. It was true that I had feared man instinctively from the first, but familiarity with him had for a while overcome that fear. Now it returned, 
and with the fear was mingled another feeling a feeling of definite hatred originally though afraid of him i had borne man no ill will whatever and would have been entirely content to go on living beside him in peace and friendliness just as we lived with the deer and the beaver man himself made that impossible and now i no longer wished it i hated him hated him thoroughly had it not been for dread of the thundersticks i should have gone down into the town and attacked the first man that i met i would have persuaded other bears to go with me to rage through the buildings destroying every man that we could find and though this was impossible i made up my mind that it would be a bad day for any man whom i might meet alone when unprotected by the weapon that gave him so great an advantage meanwhile my present business was somehow and somewhere to go on living on that first evening amid my conflict of emotions it was some time before i could bring myself to turn my back definitely upon the town for it was difficult to realise at once that there was in truth no longer any car were there nor any reason for my going again among the buildings and it was late in the night before i finally started to look for my father and mother i went of course to the place where i had left them and where the fight with the stranger had taken place they were not there when i arrived but i saw that they had spent the preceding day at home and would in all probability be back soon after it was light so i stayed in the immediate neighbourhood and before sunrise they returned my mother was glad to see me but i do not think i can say as much for my father i told them where i had been and of my visits to the town and of poor Kawa's death and though at the time father did not seem to pay much attention to what i said next day he suggested that we should move further away from the neighbourhood of men the following afternoon we started making our way back along the stream by which we had descended and soon finding ourselves once more in the region that had been swept by the fire it was still desolate but the two months that had passed had made a wonderful difference it was covered by the bright red flowers of a tall plant standing nearly as high as a bear's head which shoots up all over the charred soil whenever a tract of forest is burned other undergrowth may come up in the following spring but for the first year nothing appears except the red fireweed and that grows so thickly that the burnt wood is a blaze of colour out of which the blackened trunks of the old trees stand up naked and gaunt we passed several houses of men by the waterside and gave them a wide berth we learned from the beavers and the ospreys that a number of men had gone up the stream during the summer and few had come back so that now there must be many more of them in the district swept by the fire than there had been before we did not wish to live in the burnt country however because there was little food to be found there and under the fireweed the ground was still covered with a layer of the bitter black stuff which on being disturbed got into one's throat and eyes and nostrils so we turned southwards along the edge of the track of the fire and soon found ourselves in a country that was entirely new to us though differing little in general appearance from the other places with which we were familiar the same unbroken succession of hills and gulches covered with the dense growth of good forest trees it was in fact bears country and in it we felt at home 
for the most part we travelled in the morning and evening but the summer was gone now and on the higher mountains it was sometimes bitterly cold so we often kept on moving all day we were not going anywhere in particular only endeavouring to get away from man and if possible to find a region where he had never been but it seemed as if man now was pushing in everywhere we did not see him but continually we came across the traces of him along the banks of the streams the beavers and the kingfishers and the ospreys of course know everything that goes on along the rivers nothing can pass upstream or down without going by the beaver dams and the beavers are always on the watch you might linger about a beaver dam all day and except for the smell which a man would not notice you would not believe there was a beaver near but they are watching you from the cracks and holes in their homes and in the evening if they are not afraid of you you will be astonished to see twenty or thirty beavers come out to play about what you thought was an empty house we never passed a dam without asking about man and always it was the same tale men had been there a week ago or the day before or when the moon last was full and the kingfishers and the ospreys told us the same things so we kept on our way southward as the days went on i grew to think less of kawa the memory of those nights spent in the town with the lights and the strange noises and the warm man-smell all about me began to fade until they all seemed more like incidents of a dream than scenes which i had actually lived through only a few weeks before i began to feel more as i used to feel in the good old days before the fire and came again to be a part of the wild wholesome life of the woods moreover i was growing my mother said that i was growing fast no puma would have dared to touch me now and my unusual experiences about the town had bred in me a spirit of independence and self-reliance so that other cubs of my own age whom we met and who of course had lived always with their parents always seemed to me younger than i and certainly i was bigger and stronger than any first-year bear that i saw on the whole i would have been fairly contented with life had it not been for the estrangement which was somehow growing up between my father and myself i could not help feeling that though i knew not why he would have been glad to have me go away again so i kept out of his way as much as possible seldom speaking to him and of course not venturing to share any food that he found on the first evening after my return he had rolled over an old log and mother and i went up as a matter of course to see what was there but he growled at me in a way that made me stand off while he and mother finished the fungi and the beetles after that i kept my distance it did not matter much for i was well able to forage for myself but i would have preferred to have him kinder his unkindness however did not prevent him from taking for himself anything which he wanted that i had found one day i came across some honey from which he promptly drove me away and i had to look on while he and mother shared the feast between them at last we came to a stream where the beavers told us that no man had been seen in the time of any member of their colony then living the stream which was here wide enough to be a river came from the west and for two or three days we followed it down eastwards and found no trace or news of man 
so we turned back up it again back past the place where we had first struck it and on along its course for another day's journey into the mountains it was perhaps too much to hope that we had lighted on a place where man would never come but at least we knew that for a distance of a week's travelling in all directions he never yet had been and it might be many years before he came meanwhile we should have a chance to live our lives in peace here we stayed moving about very little and feeding as much as we could for winter was coming on and a bear likes to be fat and well fed before his long sleep it rained a good deal now as it always does in the mountains in the late autumn and as a general rule the woods were full of mist all day in which we went about tearing the roots out of the soft earth eating the late blueberries where we could find them and the cranberries and the elderberries which were ripe on the bushes now and then coming across a clump of nut trees and once in a while the greatest of all treats revelling in a feast of honey one morning after a cold and stormy night we saw that the tops of the highest mountains were covered with snow it might be a week or two yet before the snow fell over the country as a whole or it might be only a day or two for the wind was blowing from the north biting cold and making us feel numb and drowsy so my father decided that it was time to make our homes for the winter he had already fixed upon a spot where a tree had fallen and torn out its roots making a cave well shut in on two sides and blocked on a third by another fallen log and here without thinking i had taken it as a matter of course that we should somehow all make our winter homes together but when that morning he started out with mother after him and i attempted to follow he drove me away i followed yet for a while but he kept turning back and growling at me and at last told me bluntly that i must go and shift for myself i took it philosophically i think but it was with a heavy heart that i turned away to seek a winter home for myself it did not take me long to decide on the spot at the head of a narrow gully where at some time or other a stream must have run there was a tree half fallen and leaning against the hillside a little digging behind the tree would make as snug and sheltered a den as i could want so i set to work and in the course of a few hours i had made a sufficiently large hollow and into it i scraped all the leaves and pine needles in the neighbourhood and by working about inside and turning round and round i piled them up on all sides until i had a nest where i was perfectly sheltered with only an opening in front large enough to go in and out of this opening i would almost close when the time came but for the present i left it open and lived inside sleeping much of the time but still continuing for a week or ten days to go out in the mornings and evenings for food but it was getting colder and colder and the woods had become strangely silent the deer had gone down to the lower ground at the first sign of coming winter and the coyotes and the wolves had followed to spend the cold months in the foothills and on the plains about the haunts of man the woodchucks were already asleep below ground and of the birds only the woodpeckers and the crossbills and some smaller birds fluttering among the pine branches remained there was a fringe of ice along the edges of the streams and the kingfishers and the ospreys had both flown to where the waters would remain open throughout the year 
the beavers had been very busy for some time but now if one went to the nearest dam in the evening there was not a sign of life at last the winter came it had been very cold and grey for a day or two and i felt dull and torpid and then one morning towards midday the white flakes began to fall there had been a few little flurries of snow before lasting only for a minute or two but this was different the great flakes fell slowly and softly and soon the whole landscape began to grow white through the opening in my den i watched the snow falling for some time but did not venture out and as the afternoon wore on and it only fell faster and faster i saw that it would soon pile up and close the door upon me there was no danger of its coming in for i had taken care that the roof overhung far enough to prevent anything falling in from above and the den was too well sheltered for the wind to drift the snow inside so i burrowed down into my leaves and pine needles and worked them up on both sides till only a narrow slit of an opening remained and through this slit sitting back on my haunches against the rear of the little cave i watched the white wall rising outside all that night and all next day it snowed and by the second evening there was hardly a ray of light coming in i remember feeling a certain pride in being all alone in the warm nest made by myself for the first time in my life and i sat back and mumbled at my paw and grew gradually drowsier and drowsier till i hardly knew when the morning came for i was very sleepy and the daylight scarcely pierced the wall of snow outside and before another night fell i was asleep while outside the white covering which was to shut me in for the next four months at least was growing thicker until it was many feet deep all around and under it i was as safe and snug up there in the heart of the mountains as ever a man could be in any house that he might build End of chapter seven chapter eight of the life story of a black bear this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by wayne anderson chelsea quebec the life story of a black bear by harry perry robinson chapter eight alone in the world have you any idea how frightfully stiff one is after nearly five months consecutive sleep of course a bear is not actually asleep for the greater part of the time but in a deliciously drowsy condition that is halfway between sleeping and waking it is very good of course you lose all count and thought of time days and weeks and months are all the same you only know that having been asleep you are partly awake again there is no light but you can see the wall of your den in front of you and dimly you know that while all the world outside is snow-covered and swept with bitter winds and the earth is gripped solid in the frost you are very warm and comfortable changes of temperature do not reach you and you sit and croon to yourself and mumble your paws and all sorts of thoughts and tangled scraps of dreams go swimming through your head until before you know it you've forgotten everything and are asleep again then again you find yourself awake is it hours or days or weeks since you were last awake you do not know and it does not matter so you croon and mumble and dream and sleep again and wake and croon and mumble and dream sometimes you are conscious of feeling stiff and think you will change your position but after all it does not matter nothing matters 
where you are already floating off again. The wall of your den grows indistinct, and you are away in dreams once more for an hour or a day or a week. At last, a day comes when you wake into something more like complete consciousness than you have known since you shut yourself up. There's a new feeling in the air. A sense of moisture and fresh smells are mingling with the warm, dry scent of your den. And you are aware that you have not changed your position for more than a quarter of a year, but have been squatting in your heels with your back against the wall and your nose folded into your paws across your breast. And you want to stretch your hind legs dreadfully, but you do not do it. It is still too comfortable where you are. You may move a little and have a vague idea that it might be rather nice outside, but you do not go to see. You only take the other paw into your mouth, and still crooning to yourself, you are asleep again. This happens again and again, and each time the change in the feeling of the air is more marked and the sense of the new year outside grows stronger and more pungent. At last one day comes daylight where the snow is melted from the opening in front of you. And with the daylight come the notes of birds and the ringing of the woodpecker, rat-tat-tat, rat-tat-tat, from a tree nearby. But even these signs that the spring is at hand again would not tempt you out if it were not for another feeling that begins to assert itself and will not let you rest. You find you are hungry, horribly hungry, it is of no use to say to yourself that you are perfectly snug and contented where you are and that there is all the spring and summer to get up in. You are no longer contented. It is nearly five months since you had your last meal, and you will not have another till you go out for yourself and get it. Mumbling your paws will not satisfy you. There is really nothing for it but to get up. But, oh, what a business it is, that getting up. Your shoulders are cramped and your back is stiff. And as for your legs underneath you, you wonder if they really ever will get supple and strong again. First, you lift your head from your breast and try moving your neck about and sniff at the walls of your den. Then you unfold your arms and, ouch, how they crack. First one and then the other. At last, you begin to roll from one side to the other and try to stretch each hind leg in turn. Then, cautiously letting yourself drop on all fours, you give a step, and before you know it, you have staggered out into the open air. It is very early in the morning, and the day is just breaking, and all the mountainside is covered with a clinging, pearly mist. But to your eyes, the light seems very strong, and the smell of the new moist earth and the resinous scent of the pines almost hurts your nostrils. One side of the gully in front of you is brown and bare, but in the bottom and clinging to the other side are patches of moist and half-melted snow. And on all sides you hear the drip of falling moisture and the ripple of little streams of water which are running away to swell the creeks and rivers in every valley bottom. You are shockingly unsteady on your feet and feel very dazed and feeble, but you are also hungrier than ever now, with the keen morning air wetting your appetite, and the immediate business ahead of you is to find food. So you turn to the bank at your side and begin to grub, and as you grub, you wander on, eating the roots that you scratch up and the young shoots of plants that are appearing here and there. And all the time the day is growing and the sensation is coming back to your limbs and your hunger is getting satisfied and you are wider and wider awake, and thoroughly interested in what you are about, before you are aware of it, you are fairly started on another year of life. That is how a bear begins each spring. It may be a few days later or a few days earlier when one comes out, but the sensations are the same. You are always just as stiff, and the smells are as pungent, and the light is as strong, and the hunger as great. For the first few days, you really think of nothing but of finding enough to eat. As soon as you have eaten, and eaten until you think you are satisfied, you are hungry again. And so you wander around looking for food and going back to your den to sleep. That spring, when I came out, it was very much as it had been the spring before when I was a little cub. 
The squirrels were chattering in the trees. I wondered whether old Blackie had been burned in the fire. And the woodpecker was as busy as ever, rat-tat-tat, rat-tat-tat, overhead. There were several woodchucks, fat, waddling things, living in the same gully with me. And they had been abroad for some days when I woke up. On my way down to the stream on that first morning, I found a porcupine in my path, but did not stop to slap it. By the river's bank, the little brown-coated minks were hunting among the grass, and by the dam, the beavers were hard at work protecting and strengthening their house against the spring floods, which were already rising. It was only a couple of hundred yards or so from my den to the stream, and for the first few days I hardly went further than that. But it was impossible that I should not all the time, that is, as soon as I could think of anything except my hunger, be contrasting this spring with the spring before when Kawa and I had played about the rock and the cedar trees, and I had tumbled down the hill, and the more I thought of it, the less I liked being alone, and my mother and father I knew must be somewhere close by me, for I presumed they had spent the winter in the spot that they had chosen, so I made up my mind to go and join them again. It was in the early evening that I went, about a week after I'd come out of my winter quarters, and I had no trouble in finding the place, but when I did find it, I also found things that I did not expect. Surely, I said to myself as I came near, that is little Kawa's voice. There could be no doubt about it. She was squealing just as she used to do when she tried to pull me away from the rock by my hind foot. So I hurried on to see what it could mean, and suddenly the truth dawned upon me. My parents had two new children. I had never thought of that possibility. I heard my mother's voice warning the cubs that someone was coming, and as I appeared, the young ones ran and snuggled up to her and stared at me as if I was a stranger, and they were afraid of me, as I suppose they were. It made me feel awkward and almost as if my mother was a stranger too, but after standing still for a little time and watching them, I walked up. Mother met me kindly, but somehow not like a mother meeting her own cub, but like a she-bear meeting any he-bear in the forest. The cubs kept behind her and out of the way. I spoke to mother and rubbed noses with her and told her that I was glad to see her. She evidently thought well of me, and I was rather surprised when standing beside her to find that she was not nearly so much bigger than I, as I had supposed. But before I had been there more than a minute, mother gave me a warning that father was coming, and turning, I saw him walking down the hillside towards us. He saw me at the same time and stopped and growled. At first I think, not knowing who I was, he was astonished to see my mother talking to a strange bear. When he did recognize me, however, I might still have been a stranger for any friendliness that he showed. He sat up in his haunches and growled, and then came on slowly, swinging his head and obviously not at all disposed to welcome me. Again I was surprised to see that he was not as big as I had thought, and for a moment wild ideas of fighting him, if that was what he wanted, came into my head. I wished to stay with mother, and even though he was my father, I did not see why I should go away alone and leave her. But tall though I was getting, I had not anything like my father's weight, and however bitterly I might wish to rebel, rebellion was useless. Besides, my mother, though she was kind to me, would undoubtedly have taken my father's part, as it was right that she should do. So I moved slowly away as my father came up, and as I did so, even the little cubs growled at me, siding, of course, with their father against the stranger whom they had never seen. Father did not try to attack me, but walked up to mother and began licking her to show that she belonged to him. I disliked going away and thought that perhaps he would relent, but when I sat down, as if I was intending to stay, he growled, and told me that I was not wanted. I ought by this time to have grown accustomed to being alone and to have been incapable of letting myself be made miserable by a snub, even from my father, but I was not. I was wretched. I do not think that even on the first night after Kawa was caught, or on that morning when I saw her dead, that I felt as completely forlorn as I did that day when I turned away from my mother and went down the mountainside back to my own place alone. The squirrels chattered at me, and the woodpecker rat-tat-tatted, and the woodchuck scurried away, and I hated them all. What company were they to me? 
I was lonely, and I craved the companionship of my own kind. But it was to be a long time before I found it. I was now a solitary bear, with my own life to live and my own way to make in the world, with no one to look to for guidance and no one to help me if I needed help. But many regarded me as an enemy and would have rejoiced if I were killed. In those first days I thought of the surly solitary bear who had taken our home while we were away, and whom I had vowed some day to punish, and I began to understand in some measure why he was so bad-tempered. If we had met then, I almost believe I would have tried to make friends with him. I have said that many animals would have rejoiced had I been killed. This is not because bears are the enemies of other wild things, for we really kill very little except beetles and other insects, frogs and lizards and little things like mice and chipmunks. We are not as the wolves, the coyotes, the pumas, or the weasels, which live on the lives of other animals, and which every other thing in the woods regards as its sworn foe. Still, smaller animals are mostly afraid of us, and the carcass of a dead bear means a feast for a number of hungry things. If a bear cannot defend his own life, he will have no friends to do it for him. And while, as I have said before, a full-grown bear in the mountains has no need to fear any living thing, man always accepted, in a stand-up fight, it is none the less necessary to be always on one's guard. In my case, fear had nothing to do with my hatred of loneliness. Even the thought of man himself gave me no uneasiness. I was sure that no human beings were as yet within many miles of my home, and I knew that I should always have abundant warning of their coming. Moreover, I already knew man. He was not to me the thing of terror and mystery that he had been a year ago, or that he still was to most of the forest folk. I had cause enough, it is true, to know how dangerous and how savagely cruel he was, and for that I hated him. But I had also seen enough of him to have a contempt for his blindness and his lack of the sense of scent. Had I not, again and again, when in the town, dodged round the corner of a building and waited while he passed a few yards away, or stood immovable in the dark shadow of a building and looked straight at him while he went by, utterly unconscious that I was near? Nothing could live in the forest for a week with no more eyesight, scent, or hearing than a man possesses, and without his thunderstick he would be as helpless as a lame deer. All this I understood, and was not afraid that if our paths should cross again, I should not be well able to take care of myself. But while there was no fear added to my loneliness, the loneliness itself was bad enough. Having none to provide for except myself, I had no difficulty in finding food. For the first few weeks, I think, I did nothing but wander aimlessly about and sleep, still using my winter den for that purpose. As the summer came on, however, I began to rove, roaming usually along the streams and sleeping there in the cool herbage by the water's edge during the heat of the day. My chief pleasure, I think, was in fishing, and I was so glad my mother had shown me how to do it. No bear, when hungry, could afford to fish for his food, for it takes too long. But I had all my time to myself, and nearly every morning and evening I used to get my trout for breakfast or for supper. At the end of a long, hot day, I know nothing pleasanter than, after lying a while in the cold running water, to stretch oneself out along the river's edge under the shadow of a bush, wait, paw, and water, till the trout comes gliding within striking distance, and then the sudden stroke, and afterwards the comfortable meal off the cool, juicy fish in the soft night air. I became very skillful at fishing and from days and days of practice it was seldom indeed that I lost my fish if once I struck. Time, too, I had for honey hunting, but I was never sure that it was worth the trouble and pain. In nine cases out of ten the honey was too deeply buried in a tree for me to be able to reach it, and in trying I was certain to get well stung for my pains. Once in a while, however, I came across a comb that was easy to reach, and the chance of one of those occasional finds made me spend not hours only but whole days at a time looking for the bees' nests. Along by the streams were many blueberry patches, though none so large as that which had cost Kawa her life. 
but during the season I could always find berries enough, and so, fishing and bee-hunting, eating berries and digging for roots, I wandered on through the summer. I had no one place that I could think of as a home more than any other. I preferred not to stay near my father and mother, and so let myself wander, heading for the most part westward and further into the mountains as the summer grew, and then in the autumn turning south again. I must have wandered over many hundred miles of mountain. But when the returning chill in the air told me that winter was not very far away, I worked round so as to get back into somewhat the same neighborhood as I had been in last winter, not more perhaps than ten miles away. On the whole it was an uneventful year. Two or three times I met a grizzly, and always got out of the way as fast as I could. Once only I found myself in the neighborhood of man, and I gave him a wide berth. Many times, of course, in fact nearly every day, I met other bears like myself, and sometimes I made friends with them, and stayed in their company for the better part of a day, perhaps a berry patch, or in the wide shallows of a stream. But there was no place for me, a strong, growing he-bear, getting on for two years old, in any of the families that I came across. Parents with young cubs did not want me. Young bears in their second year were usually in couples. The solitary bears that I met were generally he-bears, older than I, and though we were friendly on meeting, neither cared for the other's companionship. Again and again in these meetings I was struck by the fact that I was unusually big and strong for my age, the result, I suppose, as I have already said, of the accident that threw me on my own resources so young. I never met young bears of my own age that did not seem like cubs to me. Many times they came across bears who were one and even two years older than myself, but who had certainly no advantage of me in height, and I think none in weight but I had no occasion to test my strength in earnest that summer, and when winter came and the mountain peaks in the neighborhood showed white again against the dull gray sky, I was still a solitary animal and acutely conscious of my loneliness. That year I made my den in a cave which I found high up on a mountainside and which had evidently been used by bearers at some time or other, though not for the last year or two. There I made my nest with less trouble than the year before, and at the first serious snowfall I shut myself up for another long sleep. End of chapter 8 Recording by Wayne Anderson, Chelsea, Quebec Chapter 9 of The Life Story of a Black Bear This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter 9. I Find a Companion. The next spring was late. We had a return of cold weather long after winter ought to have been over, and for a month or more after I moved out, it was no easy matter to find food enough. The snow had been unusually deep, and had only half melted when the cold returned, so that the remaining half stayed on the ground a long while, and sometimes it took me all my time grubbing up camas roots, turning over stones and logs, and ripping the bark off fallen trees to find enough to eat to keep me even moderately satisfied. Besides the mice and chipmunks which I caught, I was forced by hunger to dig woodchucks out of their holes and eat the young ones, though hitherto I had never eaten any animal so large. Somehow, in one way and another, I got along, and when spring really came, I felt that I was a full-grown bear and no longer a youngster who had to make way for his elders when he met them in the path. Nor was it long before I had an opportunity of seeing that the other bears also regarded me no longer as a cub. I had found a bee's nest about ten feet up in a big tree, and of course climbed up to it. But it was one of those cases of which I have spoken, when the game was not worth the trouble. The nest was in a cleft in the tree, 
too narrow for me to get my arm into, and I could smell the honey a foot or so away from my nose without being able to reach it, than which I know nothing more aggravating. And while you are hanging on to a tree with three paws and trying to squeeze the fourth into a hole, the bees have you most unpleasantly at their mercy. I was horribly stung about my face. Both my eyes and my nose were smarting abominably, and at last I could stand it no longer, but slid down to the ground again. When I reached the ground, there was another bear standing a few yards away looking at me. He had a perfect right to look at me, and he was doing me no sort of harm. But the stings of the bees made me furious, and I think I was glad to have anybody or anything to vent my wrath upon. So as soon as I saw the other bear, I charged him. He was an older bear than I, and about my size, and, as it was the first real fight that I had ever had, he probably had more experience but I had the advantage of being thoroughly angry and wanting to hurt someone, without caring whether I was hurt myself or not, while he was feeling entirely peaceable, and not in the least anxious to hurt me or anybody else. The consequence was that the impetuosity of my first rush was more than he could stand. Of course he was up to meet me, and I expect that under my coat— my skin on the left shoulder still carries the marks of his claws where he caught me, as we came together. But I was simply not to be denied, and, while my first blow must have almost broken his neck, in less than a minute I had him rolling over and over and yelling for mercy. I really believe that, if he had not managed to get to his feet and then taken to his heels as fast as he could, I would have killed him. Meanwhile, the bees were having fun with us both. It was of no use, however angry I might be, to stop to try and fight them, so as soon as the other bear had escaped, I made my own way as fast as I could, out of the reach of their stings, and down to the stream to cool my smarting face. As I lay in the water, I remember looking back with astonishment to the whole proceeding. Five minutes before, I had had no intention of fighting anybody, and had had no reason whatever for fighting that particular bear. Had I met him in the ordinary way, we should have been friendly, and I am not at all sure that if I had had to make up my mind to it in cold blood, I should have dared to stand up to him, unless something very important depended on it. Yet, all of a sudden, the thing had happened— I had had my first serious fight with a bear older than myself, and had beaten him. Moreover, I had learned the enormous advantage of being the aggressor in a fight, and of throwing yourself into it with your whole soul. As it was, though I was astonished at the entire affair, and surprised at myself, and although the bee stings still hurt horribly, I was pretty well satisfied and rather proud. Perhaps it was as well that I had had that fight then, for the time was not far distant when I was to go through the fight of my life. A bear may have much fighting in the course of his existence, or he may have comparatively little, depending chiefly on his own disposition. But at least once he is sure to have one fight on which almost the whole course of his life depends and that is when he fights for his wife. Of course, he may be beaten, and then he has to try again. Some bears never succeed in winning a wife at all. Some may win one, and then have her taken from them, and have to seek another. But I do not believe that any bear chooses to live alone. Everyone will once at least make an effort to win a companion who will be the mother of his children. The crisis came with me that summer, though many bears, I believe, prefer to run alone until a year or even two years later. The summer had passed like the former one, rather uneventfully, after the episode of the bees. 
I wandered abroad, roaming over a wide tract of the country, fishing, honey-hunting, and finding my share of roots and beetles and berries, sheltering during the heat of the day, and going wherever I felt inclined in the cool of the night and morning. I think I was disposed to be rather surly and quarrelsome, and more than once took upon myself to dispute the path with other bears, but they always gave way to me, and I felt that I pretty well had the mountains and the forests for my own. But I was still lonely, and that summer I felt it more than ever. The late spring had ruined a large part of the berry crop, and the consequence was that wherever there was a patch with any fruit on it, bears were sure to find it out. There was one small sheltered patch which I knew, where the fruit had nearly all survived the frosts. I was there one evening when, not far from me, out of the woods came another bear of about my size. I was inclined to resent it at first, but then I saw that it was a she-bear, and I liked her the moment I obtained a good view of her. She saw me, and sat up, and looked at me amicably. I had never tried to make love before, but I knew what was the right thing to do, so I approached her slowly, walking sideways, rubbing my nose on the ground, and mumbling into the grass to tell her how much I admired her. She responded in the correct way, by rolling on the ground. So I continued to approach her, and I cannot have been more than five or six yards away, when out of the bushes behind her, to my astonishment, came another he-bear. He growled at me, and began to sniff around at the bushes, to show that he was entirely ready to fight, if I wanted to. And of course I wanted to. I probably should have wanted to in any circumstances, but when the she-bear showed me that she liked me better than him, by growling at him, I would not have gone away without fighting for her for all the berries and honey in the world. One of the most momentous crises in my life had come, and, as all such things do, had come quite unexpectedly. He was as much in earnest as I, and for a minute we sidled round, growling over our shoulders, and each measuring the other. There was little to choose between us, for, if I was a shade the taller, he was a year older than I, and undoubtedly the heavier and thicker. In fighting all other animals except those of his kind, a bear's natural weapons are his paws, with one blow of which he can crush a small animal, and either stun or break the neck of a larger one. But he cannot do any of these three things to another bear as big as himself, and only if one bear is markedly bigger than the other can he hope to reach his head, so as either to tear his face, or give him such a blow as will daze him and render him incapable of going on fighting. A very much larger bear can beat down the smaller one's arms and rain such a shower of blows upon him as will convince him at once that he is overmatched and make him turn tail and run. When two are evenly matched, however, the first interchange of blows with the paws is not likely to have much effect either way and the fight will have to be settled by closing, by the use of teeth and main strength. But as I had learned in my fight that day when I had been stung by the bees, the moral effect of the first rush may be great, and it was in that that my slight advantage in height and reach was likely to be useful, whereas, if we came to close quarters slowly, the thicker and stockier animal would have the advantage. So I determined to force the fighting with all the fury that I could, and I did. It was he who gave the first blow. As we sidled up close to one another, he let out at me wickedly with his left paw, a blow which, if it had caught me, would undoubtedly have torn off one of my ears. Most bears would have replied to that with a similar swinging blow. When they got an opening, and the interchange of single blows at arm's length would have gone on indefinitely until one or the other lost his temper and closed. I did not wait for that. 
the instant the first blow whistled past my head, I threw myself on my hind quarters and launched myself bodily at him, hitting as hard as I could and as fast, first with one paw, then with the other, without giving him time to recover his wits or get in a blow himself. I felt him giving way as the other bear had done, and when we closed, he was on his back on the ground, and I was on the top of him. The fight, however, had only begun. I had gained a certain moral effect by the ferocity of my attack, but a bear, when he is fighting in earnest, is not beaten by a single rush, nor indeed until he is absolutely unable to fight longer. Altogether, we must have fought for over an hour. Two or three times we were compelled to stop and draw apart, because neither of us had strength left to use either claws or jaw, and each time when we closed again I followed the same tactics, rushing in and beating him down and doing my best to cow him before we gripped, and each time, I think, it had some effect, at least to the extent that it gave me a feeling of confidence, as if I was fighting a winning fight. The deadliest grip that one bear can get on another is with his jaws across the other's muzzle, when he can crush the whole face in. Once he very nearly got me so, and this scar on the side of my nose is the mark of his tooth. But he just failed to close his jaws in time. And, as it proved then, it is a dangerous game to play, for it leaves you exposed if you miss your grip, and in this case it gave me the opportunity that I wanted to get my teeth into his right paw, just above the wrist. My teeth sank through the flesh and tendons and closed upon the bone. In time, if I could hold my grip, I would crush it. His only hope lay in being able to compel me to let go by getting his teeth in behind my ear, and this we both knew, and it was my business, with my right paw, to keep his muzzle away. A moment like that is terrible. And splendid. I have never found myself in his position, but I can imagine what it must be. We swayed and fell together, and rolled over and over, now he uppermost, now I, but never for a second did I relax my hold. Whatever position we were in, my teeth were slowly grinding into the bone of his arm, and again and again I felt his teeth grating and slipping on my skull as I clawed and pushed blindly at his face to keep him away. More and more desperate he grew, and still I hung on, and while I clung to him in dead silence, he was growling and snarling frantically, and I could hear his tone getting higher and higher, till, just as I felt the bone giving between my teeth, the growling broke and changed to a whine, and I knew that I had won. One more wrench with my teeth, and I felt his arm limp and useless in my mouth. Then I let go, and as he cowered back on three legs, I reared up and fell upon him again, hitting blow after blow with my paws, buffeting, biting, beating, driving him before me. Even now he had fight left in him, but with all his pluck he was helpless with his crippled limb, and slowly I bore him back out of the open patch where we had been fighting, into the woods, and yard by yard up the hill, until at last it was useless for him to pretend to fight any longer, and he turned, and as best he could, limping on three legs, ran. During the whole of the fight, the she-bear had not said a word, but sat on the ground, watching and awaiting the result. While the battle was going on, I had no time to look at her, but in the intervals when we were taking breath, whenever I turned in her direction, she avoided my eye and pretended not to know that I was there, or that anything that interested her was passing. She looked at the sky and the trees, and washed herself, or did whatever would best show her indifference, all of which only told me that she was not indifferent at all. Now, when I came back to her, she still pretended not to see me until I was close up to her, 
and when I held out my nose to hers, she growled as if a stranger had no right to behave in that way. But I knew she did not mean it, and I was very tired and sore, with blood running from me in a dozen places. So I walked a few yards away from her and lay down. In a minute she came over to me and rubbed her nose against mine and told me how sorry she was for having snubbed me, and then began to lick my wounds. She told me how splendidly I had fought, and, mauled though I was, I was very proud and happy. She, in turn, told me all about herself. She was older than I by two years, and the bear that I had beaten was a year older than myself. She had known him for some three weeks only, having met him a few days after her husband and her two children, the first she had ever had, had been killed by a thunderstick. That was a long way off over there, pointing eastward, and she had been moving away from the neighbourhood of man ever since. That gave us a new bond of sympathy, and I told her about Kawa and myself, and how lonely I had been for the last two summers. Now, with her help, I proposed not to be lonely any more. She saw that I was well able to take care of myself and of her, even though I was only three years old. If I filled out in proportion to my height and the size of my bones, there would not be a bear in the forest that would be able to stand up to me by the end of next summer. She told me that she had liked me the moment we met, and had hoped every minute of the fight that I would win, though, of course, it would not have been proper for her to show it. Altogether, I was happier than I had been since the old days before Kawa was caught. As soon as I was fairly rested, we got up and made our way in the bright moonlight down to the river so that I could wash the blood off myself and get the water into my wounds. We stayed there for a while, and then returned to the patch and made a supper off the berries, and later wandered into the woods side by side. She was very kind to me, and every loving thing she did or said was a delight. It was all so wonderfully new, and when at last we lay down under the stars so that I could sleep after the strain that I had been through, and I knew that she was by me, and that when I woke up I should not be lonely any more. It all seemed almost too good to be true. It was as if I had suddenly come into a new world, and I was a new bear. End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of The Life Story of a Black Bear. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Life Story of a Black Bear by Harry Perry Robinson. Chapter 10. A VISIT TO THE OLD HOME When I awoke, I found that it was indeed all true, but I was so frightfully stiff that it was not easy to be very happy all at once. I slept straight on all through the morning until late in the afternoon. My new companion had been awake and had wandered round a little in the early morning, but without awakening me. When I awoke in the afternoon, she was asleep by my side. I tried to stand up, but every bone in my body hurt, every muscle ached, and every joint was so stiff that I could almost hear it creak. The fuss that I made in trying to get onto my feet disturbed her, and she helped me up. Somehow I managed to stagger along, and we went off for a short ramble in search of food. I could hardly dig at all, but she shared with me the roots she found, and with a few berries we made a sort of a meal, and then I was so tired that we lay down again 
and I slept right on till daybreak the following morning. After that, I felt myself again. It was days before all the stiffness wore off, and weeks before my wounds were entirely healed, while, as you can see, I carry some of the scars to this day. For some days the bear that I had beaten hung about, in the hope of tempting Woofer, that's what I called my wife, it being my mother's name, to go back to him. But he was a pitiable object, limping about with his broken leg, and I never even offered to fight him again. There was no need for it. Woofer did not wish to have anything to say to him, and she ignored him for the most part, unless he came too near, when she growled at him in a way that was not to be misunderstood. I really felt sorry for him, remembering my own loneliness, and realising that it was probably worse to lose her and have to go off alone while she belonged to somebody else than never to have known her at all. After a while, he recognised that it was hopeless, and we saw him no more. We ourselves, indeed, did not stay in the same place, but as long as the summer lasted, we wandered where we pleased. We suited each other admirably, Woofer and I. We had much the same tastes, with equal cause to hate man and to wish to keep away from his neighbourhood, and we were very nearly of the same size and strength. I never knew a bear that had a keener scent, and she was a marvel at finding honey. In many ways, it is a great advantage for two bears to be together, for they have two noses and two sets of eyes and ears, and two can turn over a log or a stone that is too heavy for one. Altogether, I now lived better and was much more free from care than I had been, while above all was the great fact of companionship, the mere not being alone. In small ways, she used to tyrannise over me, just as mother did over father. But I liked it, and neither of us ever found any titbit which was large enough to share without being willing to go halves with the other. The rest of that summer we spent together, and all the next, and I think she was as contented as I. What I had hoped came true, for I increased in weight so much that I do not think there was a bear that we saw that could have held his own against me in a fair fight. Certainly there was no pair that could have stood up against Woofer and me together, for though not quite so high at the shoulder as I, she was splendidly built and magnificently strong. On her chest she had a white spot or streak, of which she was very proud, and which she kept always beautifully white and well combed. Early in the summer of the year after I met her, I took her to visit my childhood home. It needed a week's steady travelling to get there, and when we arrived in the neighbourhood, we found the whole place so changed that I could hardly find my way. It was more than three years since I had seen it, and man had now taken possession of the whole country. For the last day or two of our journey, we had to go very carefully, for men's houses were scattered along the banks of every stream, and wherever two streams of any size came together, there had grown up a small town. In the burned district, many of the blackened trees were still standing, but the ground was carpeted with brush again, and young trees were shooting up in every direction. The beaver dams were most of them broken, and those which remained were deserted. On all sides were the marks of man's handiwork. At last we came to the beaver dam, the pool of which had saved my life in the fire. There were houses close beside the pool, and a large clearing which had been made in the forest was now a grass field. And in that field, for the first time, I saw cows. We had already passed several strings of mules and ponies on the mountain paths which the men had made, each animal carrying a huge bundle lashed on its back, and now 
we met horses dragging carts along the wide road which had been made along the border of the stream of course we did not venture near the road during the day but stayed hidden well up on the mountainside where we could hear the noise of people passing and in the evening we made our way down just as we arrived at the road going very cautiously a pair of horses dragging a wagon came along curious to see it we stayed close by and peered out from behind the trees but as they came abreast of us a gust of wind blew the scent of us to the horses and they took fright and seemed to go mad in one instant plunging and rearing they tried to turn round backing the wagon off the road into a tree then putting their heads down they started blindly thundering up the road with the wagon swaying and rocking behind them the man shouted and pulled and thrashed them with his whip but the horses were too mad with terror to listen to him on they dashed until there came a turn in the road when with a crash the wagon collided with a tree precisely what happened we could not see bits of the wagon were strewn about the road while the horses plunged on with what was left of it dangling behind them but in what was left there was no man we made our way along the edge of the road to where the crash had taken place and there among the broken wheels and splinters of the wagon we found the man lying half on the road and half in the forest dead it was some time before we could make up our minds to approach him but at last i touched him with my nose and then we turned him over with our paws we were still inspecting him when we heard the sound of other men and horses approaching and before they came in sight we slipped off into the wood we saw the new horses shy just as the former ones had done but whether at the smell of ourselves or of the dead man in the road we did not know the men managed to quiet them however and got off the wagon and after standing over the dead man for a while they lifted him and took him away with them we loitered about until it was dark and then we tried to make our way on to where my old home had been it could not be half a mile away but that half mile was beset with houses and as we drew nearer the houses became thicker until i saw that it would be useless to go on for where the cedar trees used to grow where the hill slope was that i had tumbled down where blackie the squirrel and rat tat used to live was now the middle of a town at the first sign of dawn we made our way back to the beaver pool and crossing the dam again turned our backs for ever on the neighborhood where i had spent my childhood it was no longer bear's country now for the first time i understood what the coming of man meant to the people of the forest and the mountains i had indeed seen a man town before and the men coming and going up and down the streams but somehow it had not occurred to me that where they came they never went away again these men here however with their houses their roads and cows and horses they would never go away they were wiping out the forest the animals that lived in it had vanished the very face of the mountains was changed so that i could not tell the spots that i knew best and i was sure that we would never drive them out again i was sorry that i had come to see the old home and we were a gloomy couple as we started on our return journey southwards for a long time yet we would have to go cautiously for man was all around us along the streams he had been digging 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 endlessly digging but what he gained by it we could not comprehend for we often watched him at work and he seemed to take nothing out of the ground nor to eat anything as he dug when he was not digging he was chopping trees either to build more houses to make dams across the streams or to break the wood up into pieces to burn so wherever he came the forest 
disappeared, and the rivers were disfigured with holes and ditches and piles of gravel on which no green thing grew and nothing lived that was good to eat. In travelling, we kept away from the streams as much as possible, moving along the hillsides, and only coming down to the water when we wished to cross. We had been travelling in this way for some two or three nights, when one morning, very early, we came down to a stream at a point close by a clump of buildings. The wind was blowing from them to us, and suddenly Woofa threw herself up on her haunches and gasped one word, pig. I had heard of pig before, and Woofa had eaten it to her cost, and in spite of the cost she agreed with everyone in saying that young pig is the very best thing there is to eat in all the world. I had often wondered whether some of the best scraps that I had picked up about the houses in the town in the old days might not be pig, but now I knew they were. But they were cooked and salted pig, and not the fresh young pig newly killed, which is the joy of joys to a bear. This it was that Woofa now smelled, and as the scent came into my nostrils, I knew that it was something new to me, and something very good. The smell came from a sort of pen at one side of the biggest building, not unlike that in which Kawa had been shut up, only the walls were not so high. They were too high to look over, however, and there was no way of climbing up until Woofa helped me, and, by standing on her back, I was able to see over it. It was a small square pen, the floor deep in mud, and at one end was a covered place, something like the boxes that men keep dogs in, and in the door of this covered place I could see, asleep, a large black and white sow and five little pigs. If I got inside I saw that I could climb on the roof of the covered part and get out again, so I did not hesitate, but with one scramble I was over and down in the middle of the family. Woof! What a noise they made! But with one smack of my paw, I had killed the nearest little one and grabbed it in my mouth, and in a minute I was up on the covered roof and out, with Woofer on the grass outside. We did not stop to eat the pig there, for the others were still squealing as if they were all being killed, and we were afraid that they would wake the men. So we made off as fast as we could into the wood, taking the pig with us. It was well that we did, for we had not gone far before we heard a door bang and a dog barking, and the voices of men shouting to each other. We kept on for a mile or so before we stopped, down by the side of a little stream. Then we divided the pig fairly, and nothing that I had heard about his goodness had been exaggerated. No, there are many good things in the world. Honey and berries, and sugar, and cooked things. But pig is above all others. So good was he, that if I had been by myself, I think I should have stayed there, and gone down again next night for another, and probably been shot for my pains. But as Woofer had told me long ago, it was in doing just that very thing that her husband and two children had lost their lives. They had found some pigs kept by men, just as we had, and had taken three the first night. The next night they went and got two more. The third night the men were waiting for them, and only Woofa escaped. The smell of the pig when it came to her again after two years had for the moment overcome all her fears, but she told me that she had been terrified all the time that I was in the sty and nothing on earth would tempt her to risk a second visit. I have said before that greediness is the undoing of nearly all wild animals, and however much I longed for another taste of pig, I knew that she was right. It was better to go without pig and keep alive. So we set our faces resolutely in the other direction, and kept on our course, vowing that nothing should tempt us to linger in the proximity of man. 
and very glad we both were when we found ourselves at last once more in a region where as yet man had not been seen where we could wander abroad as we pleased by night or day where the good forest smells were still untainted and where we could lie in the water of the streams at sunset or fish as long as we pleased without thought of an enemy it was a beautiful autumn that year and i think as i look back to it i was as happy then as ever in my life there had been a splendid crop of berries in contrast to the year before and now with the long clear autumn all signs pointed to a hard winter so we made our preparations for the cold season early hollowing out our dens carefully side by side under the roots of two huge trees where they were well sheltered from the wind and lining them with sticks and leaves woofer in particular spent a long time over hers and afterwards i understood why it was still bright autumn weather when the birds flying southwards told us that already snow had fallen to the north and it was bitterly cold everyone was talking of the severe winter that was ahead of us and the wolves and the coyotes had gone to the plains we were glad we had made our preparations in good time for when the winter came it came in spite of all that had been said about it unexpectedly there was no warning of snow upon the higher peaks but one night the north wind blew steadily the long night through and in the morning the winter was on us settling down on all the country peak and valley together that day we retired into our dens for good when i came out in the spring woofer had not appeared so i began to scratch away the stuff from the opening of her den and as i did so i heard new noises inside and all at once it dawned upon me that i was a father woofer had brought me a little kawa and a little waka for my own end of chapter 10